Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public and I welcome you to tonight's Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations program. Our guest is Dr. Maria Petrova, a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for International Environment and Resource Policy at Tufts University. Dr. Petrova received her PhD in Environmental Science at Oregon State University in 2010. Her research focus is the relationship between public attitudes toward renewable energy projects such as wind and wave tidal energy and the successful implementation of such projects. She analyzes the impact of social networks on public opinion and public perceptions of the value of renewable energy technologies. When she was on the West Coast, Dr. Petrova worked on the issue of public support for both wind energy and tidal or wave energy. Her focus here in Massachusetts has been the wind energy projects implemented especially in the Cape Cod communities. She's found that communities tend to support such projects provided their benefits are explained to residents in a timely and coherent manner but not all Cape Cod communities embraced wind energy and Dr. Petrova is here tonight to explain that variation and especially the resistance of wind energy in Falmouth. In this era of accelerating climate change, renewable energy is an urgent matter. Dr. Petrova is making a very important contribution by showing how public support for sound energy policies must be generated. We are very pleased to have her with us tonight. Welcome, Dr. Petrova. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. So good evening. I'm going to be talking tonight about public acceptance of wind energy projects in Massachusetts, what the implications are, and are there any factors for success? Um, public acceptance is not a new phenomenon. These are probably very familiar symbols and of what you can see the Statue of Liberty when it was built, it was described as neither an object of art nor beauty. And people were debating, they protested against its, its location, it, the way it looked, they didn't want it there. Same thing happened with the Eiffel Tower, another very familiar symbol probably to everyone. Uh, when the tower was built for the Trade Expo in 1889, it was described as an eyesore, black blot, monstrous piece of work. People wanted it removed. There were petitions by famous artists and um, people, writers. So nobody wanted it there to stay. They wanted it removed immediately after the Expo. However, we all know that it's almost impossible to talk about the American values of liberty, justice, freedom, without mentioning the Statue of Liberty. And the same thing is with the Eiffel Tower. It's become a very interesting and very famous national symbol. So public acceptance has been um, shown as a major factor all along and it has played a very large importance in renewable energy policy, in the siting of social um, facilities, any type of facility that's been sited anywhere, traditional energy projects, they have encountered resistance and we've always wondered how can we site these things better so they, their siting moves smoother. Um, at the Center for International Energy and Resource Policy, we were wondering what makes it so hard in Massachusetts to cite wind energy. Why is Massachusetts named the NIMBY capital of the world? You can see it mentioned in some publications. 
So we were wondering, are there any success factors that we can point to policymakers to smooth the process? What we did is uh, we selected a couple of projects. We asked the questions that I'll show a little later. We uh, conducted surveys, and I'll present the results of those surveys with a little discussion at the end. Before I move into my results and my study, I just wanted to give you a perspective of what one turbine can do, how many uh, homes can be powered by one turbine or one megawatt. A turbine that produces one megawatt of electricity can power about 250 homes. And the average American home uses about 10 megawatt hours of electricity annually. Wind installations in America have been growing very quickly in the last years. Uh, America is only second to China in uh, capacity install of installed wind. And you can see that it's second only to gas in the United States of new sited projects. The top five American states are Texas, Iowa, California, Illinois, and Minnesota. Um, as you can see, the capacity of their installed wind ranges between 10 megawatts and 2.7 megawatts. The capacity of installed wind in Massachusetts, in case you are wondering, is about 100 megawatts. So if you can compare the ones that I showed you to what we have in Massachusetts, it's only 100 megawatts. And the goal that the state of Massachusetts has proposed to achieve was 200 megawatts of wind energy uh, to come to be produced for electricity by 2020. Right now, we are 5% off that goal. And we are wondering, or in general, scientists attribute that that we are so far from that goal, to the high density in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is third in density, in population de density of all 50 states. There are 840 people per square mile in Massachusetts. You have the high land value prices, um, the density, the, it's very expensive to site wind offshore. So all of these factors put collectively make siting of wind in Massachusetts pretty difficult. However, Massachusetts is one of the very proactive states. And um, in 1979, the first uh, turbine manufacturer was established in Burlington here in Massachusetts by UMass graduates. Um, renewable energy in Massachusetts right now provides only 4% of the electricity that we use. You can see that 74% it, it comes from natural gas, nine comes from coal-fired plants, and 12 from nuclear. So renewable energies are still a very tiny percentage of the electricity that's generated in the state. However, the state is very proactive. It started very, very early. In 1997, it started restructuring the utility infrastructure and uh, making, in 2002, creating the framework for renewable portfolio standards. Um, very early, Massachusetts was one of the first states to adopt the renewable portfolio standard. And it requires um, utilities to have certain percentage of the electricity that they're selling to be um, generated by renewable energy sources. So as you can see, the percentages are increasing. Um, here, 1% by 2003, 15 by 2020. Uh, and we are now at about 6%. So however, what Massachusetts did is try to increase renewable energies, try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and try to increase energy efficiency. So with all of these acts that have been adopted in Massachusetts, Massachusetts is right now number one in energy efficiency. And all of the factors 
are designed to promote the renewable energy implementation and energy efficiency, not only in buildings, but in automobile, <coughs> transportation, and everywhere. So given all these factors that we have from a policy perspective, it's still very hard to cite wind. And as I said, we were wondering, why is that so in Massachusetts? And are there any success factors? So we asked. Are residents really supportive of wind in general, but just not supportive of local projects? What are their major concerns? And what factors lead to community acceptance? So with that questions in mind, with those questions in mind, we selected three sites in Massachusetts to study wind. The reason we selected these three sites was because they all have capacity more than two megawatts produced, but the number of wind turbines that they have and the capacity of these turbines, turbines is different. Plus, we wanted to see if there are any difference if they're publicly sited, privately sited, and um, what are the factors that play a role. So the reason we selected these projects is to study much better how do these factors impact acceptance? I'll now um, just stop for a couple of minutes on each of these towns and the projects that they have. Hull has the lo longest um, sited wind energy project that has been there on the west, on the east coast. Um, the first commercially sited turbine in the east coast is in Hull. Uh, it was cited a long time ago in the um, late 1800s. There was a turbine at this point right here, which is called Windmill Point on the peninsula. And they were using wind turbines to produce salt, to take the salt from the uh, seawater and use it for desalinization purposes. There was a, turb a functioning turbine on the premises of the high school, which got damaged in 1985, and the residents of the town decided to replace it with another one. Uh, what's specific about Hull is that there is a municipal light plant in town, and the Hull municipal light plant was in charge of or finding all the information about the project, getting residents informed, finding out who should side the turbine, which model it should be, and what would work best for that location, and how to finance it. So they did that and installed Wind One, what they call. Um, it's about 300 feet from the high school. It's very close to the high school. And a biggest role for its acceptance played the fact that the math and the physics teacher actually used it to measure the direction of the sun, sun and they uh, were taking their students there, which made it very popular and used as an educational tool. So the residents of Hull were so happy with that turbine that they asked for another one to be sited, which happened in 2006. Uh, during that time, again, there were meetings in the communities where should it be sited? At first, they thought that it would be best to be sited near uh, Windmill Point, where the first one was sited. However, they decided that it would be better to be sited on a landfill at the other end of town. That turbine is much bigger. It's 1.8 megawatt, and it's very close to residential areas. That's the closest sited turbine to residential areas. What is very interesting also about Hull is that the electricity produced by the two turbines supplies about 13% of the town's electricity needs. And one of the things that is very important when uh, the project was proposed and presented to the town in Hull is that all the people were told that the electricity would go to power the electric lights in town. So if you have visited Hull, uh, you'll probably hear people talking how the wind from the turbines powers directly the street lights in town. So w that's why we characterize the town as having high acceptance or it's in a mature stage of development. 
The next location that we selected was Kingston. What's characteristic about Kingston is that it has five turbines, uh, one tiny one that powers about 60% of the MBTA uh, transfer station that is there, one um, that belongs to the town, it's called the Independence, and it was sited on April 15, 2012, and three private ones that are owned by the first uh, woman wind developer on her site, which is a gravel pit. Um, they're all each two megawatts, and they um, supply about 60% of the needs of the nearby areas. However, the electricity from there is being sold directly to the grid. Um, there are some problems in Kingston concerning visual. Uh, some people say it's too close to the highway. It's only 300 feet to the highway, but still they worry about ice throw. And ice throw is when in the winter uh, snow accumulates on the blades and they turn and ice pieces or ice blocks can fall on the highway. So people worry about that. There haven't been any instances anywhere near, but still that's a worry that people have there. They also worry about noise and flicker. So that's one of the reasons that we call Kingston, we've named it Emerging and Engaged. And the last project that we started was Falmouth. So Falmouth has its turbine sited most recently. Um, all of these projects started to materialize pretty much in 2008 with the Green Communities Act in Massachusetts. And that's when the green communities were formed in these towns. That's when they started putting um, towers to measure the velocity of the wind and see what's the best location to place them. So Falmouth decided that they can put two turbines on the wastewater treatment plant. And um, together, these two turbines would supply about 60% of the energy needs of the wastewater treatment plant. So the turbines have been in operation, the first one since 2010, the second one a little later, but they've been in operation on and off because of concerns that residents have, especially neighbors, about noise and health effects of those turbines. And that's the reason that we call Falmouth's development pretty much in intensive care. There was recently a vote that took place in the town of Falmouth. The residents um, were voting to either keep the turbines or remove them. So Falmouth has the potential to become the first place in America and anywhere in the world to have functioning turbines removed because of citizen complaints. So in order to study what's happening in these towns, or at least to get a snapshot in time of what people think about those projects, we conducted a survey um, in last spring and summer, in April and June of last year. Uh, what we did is we mailed surveys to 1,200 people in each of these towns. There was no restriction on who can return the survey except we wanted um, residents who are 18 or older. So that was the only restriction on the survey. It was a random sample survey and the addresses were purchased from Survey Sampling International. We did three waves of mailing, which is a typical standard procedure. We got a pretty high response rate of 33% and you can see that the response rate for Falmouth is 38% which is the highest of all three locations. The survey consisted of 34 questions. That's the first page of the survey that you can see, and the questions were split in three sections, and they probed into citizens' knowledge and concerns about wind energy, their attitudes and values, and some socio-demographic characteristics like age, gender, income level, and how close they live to the turbines. So what are the results? We wanted to see, first of all, are residents supportive of wind in general before we ask them 
if they are supportive of the local wind turbines. Because from what, what we know from surveys is that people at the national level in any country are extremely supportive of any renewable energy uh, policy and technology. They are very encouraging, they are ready to support it not only uh, by saying that they're supporting it, but also financially. So we wanted to see is that what's the case here? What's the general attitude of people in Massachusetts? And you can see here that support for building wind turbines is very high. The general attitude, people say that they have very positive and positive. You can see it ranges from 71% in Falmouth to 88% in Hull. So basically across the board, the majority of the population supports wind energy. Where there are some differences are how support differs based on different locations. And there is this theory in the literature that's on wind energy called the proximity hypothesis that people who live closer to proposed sites are the ones who don't want it or who are mostly against it. So the further you go, the acceptance grows. So we wanted to check, is that the case here? And you can see that pretty much our results follow that hypothesis. What is striking is that, first of all, for Falmouth, which is the green bar here, I'm looking at the 65%. 65 percent say that they support the building of wind turbines in their communities. And that result wouldn't be surprising so much by itself, but we have to account for the fact that we got a 38 percent response rate. And usually we know from marketing research, business research, any type of research that people who respond to surveys or to anything are people who have a problem. Usually, the people who return surveys are the ones who have the most negative opinions, the ones who have to complain about something. So it's very surprising that 65% of the people from Falmouth actually support the building of wind turbines within their community. And the other thing that I would like to um, point your attention to is that Support for building turbines within one's community is a little higher than even support for building turbines offshore, which is another interesting fact that comes out of these results. So the next things we wanted to find out are what are some of the major concerns that people have that influences their attitudes toward wind. And from a very large lit literature review, we see that their perceptions differ based on visual and landscape concerns, their socioeconomic concerns, environmental, and a very important factor is how the process takes place. Do people trust the process? Are they given enough information? Do they believe that the outcome will be fair and the process will be fair? So all of these factors taken together uh, give us a better representation, a better view of what's happening in each town, and I'll compare those results for you. So the visual and noise concerns that we have, or landscape concerns, it has been established that in general, the visual and aesthetic perceptions that people have are the most important in wind energy specifically, because you can't hide wind turbines. They're so big, you can, there isn't a place you can put them that people won't see them. So basically, the visual impact is the strongest one that affects attitudes. So what we see here is that people agree across the board, pretty much, that um, wind is an attractive feature of the landscape. What are the greatest differences here, however, are the ones for Falmouth again, we're looking at the green bar, that wind turbines create noise and shadow flicker. You can see that the results from Falmouth and from the other two towns differ substantially. And what is also very interesting is that the concerns about wind and the impacts of wind are concerning noise in Falmouth and health effects. And it turns out that here, 
say that they create shadow flicker, which is something that we didn't actually expect. And shadow flicker is the flicker or the shade that the turbine um, has when the blades turn on the ground. So it, when the sun is at a specific angle. So when the sun is pointing at a wind and the blades turn, um, you can see the shadow and the shade on the ground and that's called flicker. So people apparently are concerned more about flicker than they are about uh, noise in Falmouth. And something that else that is interesting is that while 9% of the residents in Hull um, don't have a problem with the wind turbines, you can see that almost one third, 28%, yeah, agree and strongly agree that wind is an intruder in my community. And the fact that um, some kind of a facility or establishment or anything new impacts community cohesiveness and community well-being is a very important factor. So what has been found and what we asked is, how has the quality of life been impacted in your area? And what we see is that while the residents from Hull, which is the red color, 50% of them say it's for the better. In Kingston, 68% say there is no change. 38%, which is a pretty large percentage, say that the wind turbines have affected the quality of life in their area to the worst. Um, Falmouth has gone through many uh, battles in the community. There are people who want the turbines taken down by all means. They can't live in the area. Uh, they have terrible noise implications. Um, they're saying that their health is affected. When, in general, um, noise or something that is constantly bothering you is happening and you can't sleep, then the factors that happen or the next steps are depression, uh, people can't concentrate. So that, these are the health issues that are, in general, uh, associated with the noise produced by the turbines. And it's been given a name. It's called wind uh, turbine syndrome. And it's coined by a doctor here in Massachusetts, Nina Pierpont. Um, it hasn't been proven scientifically that noise impacts people either negatively or positively, in most cases negatively, from wind. However, what has been pointed out in the literature is that um, there is a link between noise and noise annoyance, the mechanical noise and how annoyed people are. And that link is mostly explained with three factors. And they are the visual perception. If people see the turbines, they think the noise is bigger. Um, wind toward their attitude toward wind, people who have a positive attitude toward wind actually are not annoyed by the noise, but ones that they that don't are, and their sensitivity to noise, which is the third important factor. So we wanted to see what of the visual and noise characteristics of the turbines actually impact people. And we asked two related questions. One is, can you see the turbines from your homes? And then only for the people who answered yes, we asked them, so do you find looking at the turbines displeasing? And what we see from these two graphs is that while 59% of the residents from Hull can see the turbines, only 7% find looking at them displeasing. So what we see is a reversal of answers we see that in Falmouth, although only 16 can see them, 16% of the people can see them, 38% find looking at them displeasing. And that reversal of answers is even more pronounced when we discuss noise. So we ask people, can you hear the turbines from your home? And if yes, do you find the sound annoying? And what we see is that only 10% of the respondents from Hull can hear the turbines. 
but um, they do not find the sound annoying here. 23% only find the sound annoying. While for Kingston and Falmouth, especially for Falmouth, what we see is that 8% of all the respondents can hear the turbines, and of them, 83% find the noise annoying. So you can see the difference, um, what I call response reversal, how it happens regarding noise. So apparently it's not just the noise, it's the whole situation, it's mostly the procedural factors, and I'll take a look at those too. So the socioeconomic factors are found to play a very important role in people's attitudes toward any siding issue. And in wind, one of the major concerns is that properties would lose their values. Um, we have indications from the literature based from the National uh, Resource Lab that property values decline for a little bit during project construction and then they go up again. We don't have actually data that has examined projects in longitudinally for a long period of time. So um, people basically, we can see here, 48%, almost 50% of the respondents from Falmouth agreed that wind turbines decrease property values. Wind turbines have been in Falmouth for a very short time. These are the most recently cited ones. But this is all um, indication that people get their information or form their opinions based on perceptions. There are studies that are done in Massachusetts that say that property values can decrease by up to 25%. However, as all the rest of the literature says, it depends on the impact of media, on social networks, on the value, the actual value of your home, the value of the market. So it's not one-to-one. -one. We can't say if it's just wind. It's very hard to separate the impact of wind and all the other factors that impact property values. However, people are so worried about losing property values because property values are usually the biggest investment that people make in their life would be in property. And losing that investment, it's very hard to diversify, people are afraid, so risk increases and threat to property values increases. And the other thing is while visual and noise perceptions are very uh, subjective, you can't measure them, usually property values you can measure. They go up or down, and you can say that they're impacted by certain factors. The same thing with the tourist industry. You can see that people are most negative towards tourism in Falmouth, the highest percentage believes that win the wind turbines will harm the local tourist industry without any indication. For example, in Hull, when the turbines were sited, uh, people still conduct tours to the turbines. You can go and hear a story of how they were sited, how much electricity is produced. They organize them regularly, and if you ask, talk to local people, they can tell you that maybe tourism revenues have increased, although they have not measured them per se. But the other indication that we have is from Denmark, where tourism has really increased. So the fact that people believe that tourism will be harmed is all based on perceptions. It's very important, the literature tells us, to provide some kind of a financial benefit to the residents in a town. Residents who are involved in the process and get a financial benefit are the ones who are most supportive. The fact that um, residents in Hull were told that their electricity lights were powered by the wind turbine and they connect the wind turbine to the lights in town plays a huge role for them to believe that their electric bill is decreased, for example. Although what the wind turbine do is just keep the rates stable because the electricity that they have to purchase on the open market is much less. Okay, so 
As far as environmental factors, people worry either about the local issues, how the local environment will be affected, or the global environment as far as reducing gre greenhouse gas emissions. And the debate about environmental factors is defined in the literature as green on green because people with environmental perceptions can be found on both sides of the debate. You can be for wind because you believe that it reduces global warming. On the other hand, you can be against wind because you believe that the local environment will be harmed. Local birds will be harmed, local wildlife. So you can be an environmentalist and still support or oppose wind. So we can see that in, oh, in the three towns, people believe that wind reduces dependence on oil, that it reduces harmful gas emissions. Um, what is interesting here is the difference between Hull and Falmouth again. While 4% of the residents in Hull believe that wind is a health hazard, that percent is, is 28. And the difference between if it's a danger to wildlife is pretty high here in all these three towns. Something that is very interesting and that um, is discussed a lot in the literature is how do people learn about those projects? Not only how, but from whom and when. So we asked them uh, when did they find out about the lo local projects in the community. And we found out that 74% of the residents in Howe found out about during planning. How in Kingston, 43% found during construction. And as we can see, 25% or a quarter of the residents of Falmouth found about the project during operation. And in my interviews, I ask people, so what does that mean? And they say, oh, we, one day we just woke up and they were there. We never heard that they were coming to town. And that we can see from these following questions, when we ask them, so where did you find out about the project? And the difference is here, I'm not sure if you can see very well, but I will tell you what the graph says, is that 27% of the people in Hull actually found from a town hall meeting or notice the Hull Municipal Light Plan did a very good job. They sent information about the project with the electric bills so people knew when meetings were taking place, were able to participate. So 27% found from the town hall and 8% found from the energy committee. So that's 35%, more than one third of the people found from an official source. Where what we see here is that um, in especially from for Falmouth, 67% found from the media, which says that either people trust the media more and they look to it for information, or the town did not do a good job of informing the people. Which one of the two needs to be checked further? We just have a hypothesis of what which one of the two, but showing that 67% of the people did not find from an official source or from the media only is a pretty good indication that people were not involved in the process. We also asked them how important it is to get adequate information. And you can see that in all towns, um, they all agree that's extremely important, and especially in Falmouth people believe that they should get adequate information. And the last question that we were examining was, um, what are the factors that lead for people to accept or oppose turbines? And the questions that we asked is, if they supported the project pre-construction, we wanted to know how many of the people actually supported the project. And what we see is that while 62% of the respondents from Hull supported the project, about half 
either supported or, or did not know about the project in Kingston and Falmouth. What is even more dramatic in their responses to the change is um, if their support has changed since the beginning of the operation of the project. And we see that in how people say 75% that there is no change, uh, while in, and pretty much in Kingston, since 64%, while in Falmouth, again, we see that this difference, 40% say that they have become less supportive, while in 47% say they have no change. So based on these results, if I can summarize, or if I may give advice to policymakers, based on all these data, it would be that people needs to f need to feel engaged in the process. How you engage them, how you provide information, that it needs to be adequate, it needs to be timely. People's concerns need to be voiced and somebody needs to respond, to respond to those concerns is very important. The fact sometimes that you do not have a uh, formal opposition doesn't mean that you won't have it at the end. And the same thing is with support. You might have a large support. Falmouth is an example of people who support the project and at the end, based on a few neighbors who are very vocal, these turbines might need to be removed very soon. The other thing that I would like to give as an advice to policymakers, and I've named my framework jokingly as with the acronym ENOUGH and it states for engagement, never use NIMBY, understand and facilitate. It's very important not to use the acronym NIMBY. It's um, used as pejorative. People are insulted when they hear it. They have very serious concerns sometimes and they need to be listened to. If people don't voice their opinions and their concerns, the opposition only gets stronger. So there is no need to use NIMBY. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't describe all the motives for opposition. And the other two things are, you have to understand what's happening in the community. You have to get some kind of baseline information to know how people felt before the process, after the project, what motivates them to support or oppose a project. And the last thing is, it's extremely important for policymakers to set those important goals of achieving 15% of wind by 2020, for example, for Massachusetts. But it's even more important to get those goals communicated to the communities and for the communities to be engaged in the process and they to be able to form and have a say in what their energy future should look like. And on my last slide, when we talk about policy goals, it's very important to have an alignment between citizen values, what citizens value and the goals of our policy, be it renewable energy policy, environmental policy, there should be always an alignment between these two. And um, the way NIMBY has been defined, back to NIMBY again, the definition of NIMBY is a person who is protecting their own turf. People who see the importance of something but cite it somewhere else. And just because of that definition, which by the way was invented by the nuclear lobby in America, as a term to describe all of the opposition in the 1980s um, and has been adopted by the literature, I would even advocate that the literature should stop using the term NIMBY and instead of we educating the policymakers how to educate the public to accept renewable energy technologies, we should be educating the policymakers not to use the term and how to advocate for better policies. So thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, um, I was at an MIT meeting where two or three of the people who were leading the Falmouth resistance to these windmills, to these turbines, were there. And one of them said he had gone around 
um, the whole world recently with his wife, checking out all of the places that were convenient that had wind, wind installations. And he found out that generally people didn't like them. And he particularly pointed out that on that famous island in Denmark that's mm -hmm. totally powered by wind, the people hated it, he said. Now, I noticed in your talk you said people of Denmark seem to like it. Do you Honest. think that there's a, um, a disconnect between receiving factual information based on the biases of one's position? Definitely, definitely. And it, that goes not only for what you heard, but even for noise and impact on property values, on tourism. This is all, in America, that's so recent, it's based on anecdotal evidence. It's all who heard what, what they read on the internet, blogs, 